My name is Paul Quigley and I teach history at Virginia Tech. I also direct the Virginia Center for Civil War Studies, which is sponsoring this event tonight. And the center's mission is really straightforward. Uh, we're in the business of educating as many different kinds of people, audiences as possible in all aspects of Civil War history. So if you're a professional historian, if you're a school teacher, a student, a member of the general public, anyone at all interested in learning more about the Civil War era is welcome to our events. And I think if you take a look at our activities, you'll find lots to interest you. Um, we host regular public lectures. Of course, tonight is a, is a really good example of that. We also sponsor academic conferences. We uh, fund student scholarships. We offer various public outreach programs. Uh, for example, we recently created a museum exhibit with the American Civil War Museum in Appomattox. Uh, we also do one of my favorites is the traveling trunk of Civil War history. Uh, it's a box of Civil War related objects. We take it out to fourth grade classrooms, uh, not during pandemic times, of course, but in normal uh, years and, uh, and talk to the kids about Civil War history. So I encourage you to keep up with what's going on at the Virginia Center for Civil War Studies. You can check out our website, civilwar.bt.edu. Uh, you can follow us on Facebook or Twitter. Uh, we're starting to get a little more active on YouTube as well. So you can subscribe to our YouTube channel too. Our next event is coming up on November 30th and it's gonna be a lecture with Dr. Adam Dumby. It's based on his recent book with the title, The False Cause fraud, fabrication, and white supremacy in Confederate memory. And that one is available to register for now. Uh, you can find the details again on the website, social media. Um, and tonight's talk and Dr. Dumby's talk on November 30th are both part of a new speaker series we're sponsoring throughout this academic year. It's called the New Perspectives on the Civil War Era series. And the intent, uh, as the name suggests, is to showcase emerging voices, up and coming scholars in Civil War era history and learn about what the new developments and, and new perspectives in the field are. The first in that series was Dr. Caroline Newhall's talk on black POWs in the Confederacy. And um, some of you I know were here for that event and I'm sure enjoyed it greatly. It was recently rebroadcast on C-SPAN and we anticipate that many of our future events, including tonight's hopefully will be uh, available in the future on C-SPAN. And so of course that means they broadcast it on, on cable TV, but also make it available on their website. So there are multiple ways that you can experience these events. Okay, uh, tonight's event, uh, our speaker is Dr. Jonathan Jones, and he's spending this year at Penn State's George and Ann Richards Civil War Era Center. So that's this year, he's a postdoctoral scholar at Penn State. Next year in the fall, he's gonna take up a new position as assistant professor of history at the Virginia Military Institute. So I'm really looking forward. It's not too far away from Virginia Tech uh, to, to having Dr. Jones as a, a neighbor, kind of, beginning next fall. He's an expert, of course, in Civil War era history, but especially in Civil War veterans' struggles with opiate addiction. And that was the subject of his PhD dissertation at Binghamton University. He's also published a recent article in the Journal of the Civil War Era. He's working on a book on the topic. So, you know, this, this is his topic. Uh, he knows it better than anyone. And uh, we're really fortunate that tonight that's the subject of his talk. He's gonna speak for about 30, 35 minutes or thereabouts. So we'll have plenty of time for discussion at the end. Um, and the way you can engage in discussion with Dr. Jones is through the Q&A feature of Zoom. So, uh, we won't be uh, able to turn on attendees' cameras or microphones. We're going to do everything through the Q&A chat box. So open up Q&A, type in your question. We'll see it. Uh, we'll hopefully be able to get to all the questions. We'll certainly try our hardest before we wrap up around 8.15. And of course, the nice thing about this is you can ask a question at any time. If something occurs during the talk, you can type it in. Uh, we'll keep an eye on those. And uh, again, we'll respond to them after the talk as we're able. Okay, so that's all from me.
thanks to everyone for being here and special thanks of course to Dr. Jones and let's give him a warm welcome to this online forum sponsored by the Virginia Center for Civil War Studies. Thanks for being here. Um, but let's start with sort of the big picture. Uh, the US is, as, as we all know, in the grip of a massive opioid addiction crisis. Uh, since the late 1990s, millions of Americans have struggled with addiction to opioids. Um, more Americans have actually died of opioid overdoses annually since 2017 uh, than the total number of American soldiers who died in the Vietnam War, and that's every year since 2017. So this is a massive public health crisis today, and it shows no signs of slowing. Um, in fact, it's likely that this year, uh, the COVID pandemic has only exacerbated the uh, overdose rate and made um, problems of opioid addiction worse. Um, as a historian, I'm, 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 I, I continually find myself struck by the fact that the opioid crisis uh, that the US is experiencing today is framed and talked about in the news as if it's something new, as if it's something that has never happened before and is somehow unique to the conditions of, of life uh, in America today. Um, but as, as it turns out, this is not the case. The US, uh, in fact, has a long history of opioid addiction. The Civil War actually caused America's original opioid crisis, um, although it's been mostly forgotten until now. Thousands and thousands of Civil War veterans became addicted to opiate medicines like morphine in the wake of the Civil War. And like uh, Americans today, addicted veterans and their families after the Civil War endured overwhelming suffering because of their opiate addictions. Um, addiction ruined veterans' health. It destroyed their livelihoods, damaged their reputations. It, it, it really tested and strained veterans' relationships with their families. And that's something that we're gonna explore to today. Um, and in fact, what I'm gonna do today is tell the story of this broader Civil War era opioid crisis. Uh, but instead of giving you the, the view from 50,000 feet, the bird's eye view, what I'm gonna do is, is package this story as a family story the story of one family in particular, and that is the Gulrich family of Fredericksburg, uh, Virginia. So I'm gonna share my slides here and we will get a look at our protagonists. Um, okay, so uh, here are our protagonists. This is uh, John and Francis Gulrich, a married couple from Fredericksburg, Virginia. These are photos of the Gulrichs taken around 1920. Uh, the Gulrichs were prominent um, white socialites. Uh, they were fixtures on the Fredericksburg social scene from the Civil War in the 1860s until their deaths in the 1920s, so for, for quite a while. And their lives in, in so many ways represent uh, a microcosm of the fuller Civil War era, not just the period's addiction crisis. Um, to, to paint a little bit of their, their backstory for you, John was a first generation Irish American. He was a teenage uh, Confederate enlistee. Um, later after the war, he became a Fredericksburg lawyer, a prominent lawyer, and then a city judge uh, for several decades after the war. Like so many other um, elderly sort of elite Confederate veterans after the war, John was also a notable speaker and sort of a famous writer on the local Virginia lost cause circuit. And so for example, here uh, in the image on the left, we see John meeting with President Warren G. Harding on the battlefield uh, at the, on the battlefield site at the Wilderness in 1921 as part of this sectional reconciliation project that extended into the early 20th century. Um, for her part, Frances, uh, or Fanny as she was nicknamed, so I'll, I'll refer to her as Fanny tonight. Uh, Fanny Gulrich was also uh, quite famous in her, her day. She was uh, famous for being a, a major activist uh, of the Lost Cause mythology, right? She served as, for example, president of Fredericksburg's United Daughters of the Confederacy chapter. And if you've ever been to Fredericksburg, you may have seen this obelisk here. This is the Mary Washington Monument. Fanny was responsible for raising the funds used to construct it. So the John, uh, the, but here's the, the interesting thing for me about John and Fanny Gulrich. The, the, the John and Fanny that we see here in these portraits were by all accounts sort of the hallmark of elite white Virginian society after the Civil War, in the post-Civil War period. They were well-to-do. John was successful in business and civic life. Fanny was successful in high society. Um, if you looked up like well-adjusted survivors of the Civil War uh, in the dictionary, you would find John and Fanny Gulrich. They represented in so many ways the post-war life that I think most white ex-Confederate Southerners aspired to. 
But, you know, as in all things, appearances can be deceiving. There was more to the Gulrichs than meets the eye in these portraits. John and Fanny had a dark secret after the Civil War, one that they took extreme measures to conceal from the public. John Gulrich struggled morphine addiction. Um, to use the parlance of the day, John was enslaved to morphine, which ultimately came to dominate all facets of his personal life in the decades after the Civil War, uh, including his marriage with Fanny. And Fanny ended up hating John for his addiction, which ultimately tore this, the family apart in uh, a series of dramatic events that occurred in 1896. So the Gulrichs that we see here in these portraits are, were living sort of a double life after the Civil War a life of success for the outside world on the one hand, and on the other hand, a life of opiate addiction lived behind closed doors. And I think that's emblematic of how, how a lot of Civil War veterans lived with opiate addiction as we're gonna come to see. But how did this happen to the Ghoul Rigs? Like how did it come to this? Uh, what happened leading up to 1896 that imploded the Ghoul Rigs relationship? Um, so what I wanna do first is to set the stage for Fanny and John's post-war struggles by showing how the Civil War actually triggered an epidemic of addiction among veterans like John. So we're gonna begin by zooming in on a particular moment in time, and that is the 1860s, to explore the origins of this, the Civil War era opioid crisis. We're gonna see how it began. Then we're gonna jump forward in time by about 30 years to the mid 1890s. And we're gonna look at how addiction actually affected uh, in dramatic, uh, depressing ways, the lives of Civil War veterans like the Gulrichs. So let's start at the beginning, the Civil War. Like all Virginians uh, of, the, of the Civil War generation, the Gorick's lives were indelibly shaped by the experience of having lived through the Civil War, which completely upended their world. As teenagers, John and Fanny lived through the Battle of Fredericksburg in December of 1862. And when federal troops descended upon the town of Fredericksburg, determined to cross the Rappahannock River and storm through the city, uh, over Confederate um, lines at Mary's Heights, which is on a cliff or, or a hill that sits above the city, um, John and Fanny were quite literally caught in the crossfire between these two armies, the Union and the, and the Confederate armies. Uh, most residents uh, of the town fled as Union troops advanced through the city of Fredericksburg, but Fanny and her family stayed behind, hunkered down in their basement. Um, during, the, during the Battle of Fredericksburg, their house, which was on, um, if you're familiar with the geography of historic Fredericksburg, it's on Charles Street, which is sort of like the main drag that kind of runs right through downtown Fredericksburg. Um, their house was completely obliterated by cannon shot and gunfire. So here we see uh, on the slide one of the Civil War's most iconic photos, the, destruct, the destroyed houses after the Battle of, of Fredericksburg. Well, this is what Fanny's house would have looked like. She hid in the basement um, underneath the house during the battle. So ultimately, Fanny and her family um, lost everything during the war. They experienced poverty and they became war refugees. Now for his part, John also witnessed the carnage of the Battle of Fredericksburg, uh, although he was slightly too young to fight in it. Um, but the scene was fresh in his mind when a few months later in May of 1864, at about 18 or 19 years old, John enlisted in the local artillery unit called the Fredericksburg Artillery. The Fredericksburg Artillery was a hard fighting unit and it was in the thick of the Eastern theater of the Civil War, basically for the entirety of the war. Uh, before John enlisted, for example, the Fredericksburg Artillery fought in the Peninsula Campaign. They fought at Second Manassas, uh, Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville, Gettysburg, the Wilderness, Spotsylvania Courthouse. So all these highlights of the Eastern Theater, John's regiment was uh, there for it. And after he enlisted uh, in the Fredericksburg Artillery in 1864, the war only got bloodier, right? So John uh, went on to fight and in bloody fights at Cold Harbor and Petersburg. And ultimately John and just a few dozen survivors of the, the artillery outfit were present for Lee's surrender at Appomattox in April of 1865. Like so many veterans, um, John's trouble with morphine began with a bullet wound that he sustained at Petersburg. John was shot through the left thigh while defending the Confederate position here, um, which was called Fort Harrison. It was like a key segment of Lee's defensive network around the city of Richmond. In September of 1864, federal troops stormed the fort trying to push through Lee's defenses and they completely overran John and his unit defending Fort Harrison. It turned into this sort of like bloody hand-to-hand -hand combat. 
mayhem. And somehow John managed to survive. Uh, his comrades dragged the wounded um, 18 or 19 year old soldier back to a Confederate field hospital, probably just a few hundred yards from the front lines. And at the field hospital, which would have looked something like this image that we see in the top left, uh, surgeons managed to stop the bleeding from John's thigh and bandage up the wound. But John didn't get better. Um, although Lee was completely desperate for men, even wounded ones at, at this point would, would do, uh, John was simply too injured to, to patch him up and immediately send him back to the rebel front. Instead, Confederate surgeons sent him back into Richmond to be treated at Chimborazo, which was this massive 8,000 bed Confederate hospital, um, which we see in the bottom image here. Uh, that is where he was introduced to morphine at Chimborazo Hospital in Richmond. John spent about a month in the hospital, and during this time, Confederate soldiers would have given him repeated doses of morphine every day, every other day, as much as they could spare. Um, and as we all know, morphine is an addictive painkiller. The longer that you take morphine, the more likely that you are to become addicted to it. So here's where our story gets really interesting for me. Uh, the Civil War was, if, if we sort of sit back and think about the scale of, of the Civil War and Civil War medicine, the Civil War was truly a massive health crisis. It was the biggest uh, health crisis in American history up to that point. And there were millions of people in John's shoes suffering from painful wounds and sicknesses. Uh, the war caused a huge influx of sickness and gunshot wounds. To, to put a number on it, there were about 1.5 million recorded casualties out of 31 million Americans. So the bottom line is that almost everyone would have known someone like John, someone who got injured or sick during the Civil War. Now, American doctors were heading into the Civil War very inexperienced at dealing with this kind of medicine. They had never seen, never dealt with anything like this before. And most of them weren't trained to handle traumatic injuries like the gunshot wound that John suffered at Petersburg. So to deal with this unprecedented, unexpected medical crisis of the Civil War, American doctors basically uh, doubled down on the most basic medical therapies that they had available to them in their toolkit, which at this point were prescription opiates. Doctors have been using opiate medicines for thousands of years. They're actually humanity's oldest painkillers. The Greeks used them, the Romans used them, the ancient Egyptians used them. But fast forward to 1861, the year that the Civil War broke out, Opium and its derivatives were the, actually the most commonly prescribed medications in the US. They were present in somewhere between 50 and 80% of all prescriptions in the Civil War era United States. So they were ubiquitous medicines. Um, opium had a lot of upsides and that's why it was so popular. Uh, it came from a plant, so it was like easy to get and turn into medicines. You could literally grow it. Um, it was relatively simple to, to turn into more power, powerful versions uh, of itself, such as morphine or laudanum, which are liquid preparations of, of opium. Opium could also be uh, ground up into a powder and, and sort of mixed together with other kinds of drugs to make various different medicines. It could be injected as a liquid. It could be swallowed as, as powders. Um, and actually, by the way, the Civil War popularized the hypodermic needle in the U.S., uh, when during the war, Union surgeons learned how to use uh, a hypodermic syringe to inject morphine just under the skin. And I'm happy to talk more about that in the Q&A. These are actual bona fide Civil War prescriptions that contained opiates to illustrate what, I, what I'm uh, getting at here. Civil War surgeons uh, used opium and morphine for practically everything. For example, here in the image with the, the red underlines, we see um, opiates being prescribed for things like dysentery and uh, a condition that was known as chronic diarrhea. Um, these were actually some of the more common ailments of the Civil War and pulverized opium was the main remedy. Opium, it turns out, causes constipation or uh, as one doctor put it, opium, quote, corks up the bowels, which is a very pleasant um, way to describe opium's uh, effects on the bowels. Uh, and so uh, surprisingly, the most common use of opiates during the war was actually to stop diarrhea. Surgeons also gave um, hypodermic morphine shots and morphine pills and powders to treat the pain that stemmed from gunshot wounds and amputations. And that's what happened in John's case. Um, and a, a bit of foreshadow here. Uh, American doctors knew going into the Civil War that opiates were addictive when they were used for chronic conditions like pain. Uh, you, if you read antebellum medical journals, 
you, you'll find reports uh, of, of opiate addiction, doctors describing cases of addiction that they had encountered. So this was common knowledge uh, among American doctors that if you prescribe opium for a certain amount of time, chances are your patient might become uh, addicted to the drug. And it took months and months to heal from the kind of gunshot wound or, or amputation that we see here in the photo or that that John uh, endured at Petersburg. Many men actually never recovered. Um, and sur so surgeons uh, knew that when they prescribed morphine to soldiers for weeks on end, that those men would likely develop tolerance to the drug and eventually develop cases of full-blown addiction. But the simple, the simple fact is that doctors had no choice. There were no medical alternatives to opiates and the medicines were absolutely essential if surgeons were, were basically gonna patch soldiers up and send them back to the front lines. Um, the Confederate uh, Army Medical Handbook put it like this. I'll read you a quote. Um, Opium is the one indispensable drug on the battlefield, important to the surgeon as gunpowder to the ordinance. And I think any Civil War soldier would have understood that metaphor. Opiates were very important. Um, unsurprisingly, considering how widespread they were during the war, countless Civil War veterans became addicted to opiates. Some men became addicted to uh, morphine and opium during the war in hospitals like Chimborazo, where uh, John was treated for his gunshot wound in 1864. Other men um, developed their addictions after returning home from the army through the practice of self-medication. There were no, um, uh, when you go to a pharmacy today and, and ask for uh, any kind of prescription medicine in the US, you have to have uh, your, your doctor issue you a prescription and you can't just buy um, uh, addictive narcotics over the counter, but uh, that didn't exist in Civil War America. There were no real regulations on opiates until the 20th century. So you could simply walk into like a pharmacy or a general store and purchase as much as you wanted for as long as you wanted to buy it. And this is how oftentimes veterans um, got addicted. They just continued purchasing the medicine that the surgeons had given them during the army. So self-medication, a bit of self-medication and a bit of, uh, of prescription of opiates there as well. Now, it's not clear exactly when John became addicted to morphine, but I think considering the nature of his wound, it was probably early on uh, during the late 1860s. So during or shortly after the war, when the wound was relatively fresh. Imagine this, every time John walked, every time he stepped down on the ground, he would have felt probably pain shooting up his thigh. So we can imagine the level of pain that he must have been dealing with. And when we sort of think that through, it's easy to see how someone like John could become addicted to prescription morphine to dull the pain and, and just to make life bearable. During the post-war decades after the war, during the late 1860s, the 70s and the 80s, it became abundantly clear to American doctors newspaper reporters, uh, government officials, North and South, that Civil War veterans like John had become addicted by the thousands. And this, this growing uh, epidemic of, of opiate addiction among veterans actually raised real alarm bells in the wake of the Civil War. If you flip through um, newspapers dating from this period, uh, government reports, medical journals, chances are you will encounter um, sort of oblique and, and sometimes even direct references to Civil War veterans who were addicted to opiates and the, the sort of problems asso associated with opiate addiction. In Virginia, in John and Fanny's home state after the Civil War, the addiction crisis was particularly severe. For example, in 1878, the New York Times ran a piece on the, the drug problem in the Shenandoah Valley, which had been devastated during the, the Civil War, as many of you know, uh, when, when Union and Confederate forces sort of surged back and forth across the valley, burning and pillaging as they went. Uh, and the valley was also home to many Civil War survivors, just like John and Fanny. Um, according to the Times, quote, it is deplorable to observe how the evil has increased in the valley since the Civil War, and the evil that they're referring to as opiate addiction. In fact, opiate addiction seemed practically contagious, uh, according to the Times. Um, and the Times drew these implicit comparisons between opiate addiction and cholera and smallpox and, and diseases that were spread from person to, to person. Um, one, quote, one man sees another using this terrible drug, and before he is aware of it, he is eating opium himself, the Times warned. The evil of opiate addiction is like an epidemic. It is in the atmosphere of the Valley and the United States after the Civil War. Uh, 
Um, the town actually went so far as to label one city in particular in the Shenandoah Valley, the city of Stanton, as one of the valleys, um, as quote, the great opium city of this part of the country. It was notorious for having a, a particularly high population of, of people who were addicted to um, opium and, and morphine. In fact, one pharmacist in Stanton claimed to have sold almost 80,000 doses of morphine in the previous year leading up to the Times story in 1878. Now that is a lot of morphine for a town of only 6,600 people. So you can get a sense of, of kind of the spiraling scale of this epidemic. It's, it's growing and growing and growing after the Civil War to the point that uh, the government and newspapers are starting to take notice. In particular, the state government of Virginia was worried about the opium problem. So worried, in fact, that it took a radical step in 1876 and it actually opened a dedicated hospital for quote, the reclamation of opium eaters and other kinds of people with substance abuse problems. And this was a facility that was opened in Richmond in 1876 called the Pinnell Hospital. Um, the Pinnell Hospital was the first of many. There were soon within the next couple of decades, there were dozens of similar facilities uh, around the nation and veterans would oftentimes travel to these facilities, check themselves in and uh, hopefully find treatment for their, their opiate addictions. You could also find treatment in a mental asylum. Uh, this was particularly uh, a, a problem in Virginia. You could actually be committed to a mental asylum for your addiction if you lost control of yourself. So facilities like the, the Western Lunatic Asylum in Stanton, uh, another reason why Stanton was called the Great Opium City of the day, um, the asylum in Stanton took in dozens of cases of opiate addicted Civil War veterans after the Civil War who simply couldn't seem to shake what was called the opium habit on their own after leaving the army and, and taking off their Confederate uniforms. So beginning in the 1860s, asylums like Western State uh, all around the nation saw this huge spike in commitments for opiate addiction. And I think of these facilities, facilities like Western State or the Pinnell Hospital after the Civil War as being America's first drug rehabs. In asylums and in facilities like the Pinnell Hospital, veterans would usually be weaned off of opiates over a two week or a month, uh, a period of time of about two weeks or a month and hypothetically released. Um, and I will add here that although we focus so far on like the Shenandoah Valley in Virginia, by no means was the problem of, of opiate addiction unique to Virginia, it was a national problem. For example, in 1872, just a few years after the Civil War, uh, the Massachusetts Board of Health began investigating the problem of opiate addiction in cities like Boston. Uh, they found a Boston pharmacist who attested that, quote, veteran soldiers as a class are addicted to opiates. Um, so, so there was this reputation uh, among, you know, druggists, pharmacists, doctors, that Civil War veterans were particularly prone to being addicted to opiates. 17 years later, another Massachusetts doctor repeated that, that uh, claim. So evidence that the problem persisted for quite a long time after the Civil War. He told the Massachusetts Board of Health, quote, among the veterans of the war, a very large number of, of people are still suffering from chronic diarrhea. And as might be expected, some have become opium eaters, which was another 19th century term for addiction. The situation went on like this for decades. And when I say decades, I mean decades. Um, you might be, you, one might assume that uh, after the Civil War, veterans oftentimes overdosed um, as a, a consequence of their addictions. And yes, in the war's immediate aftermath, lots of veterans did fatally overdose on opium and morphine. And you see this in newspaper obituaries, coroner's records, and things like that from the 1860s and 1870s. But some veterans survived for years and years with their addictions. For example, uh, one, one uh, Union veteran, a guy named Perry Bowser, became addicted to morphine in a Vicksburg Army hospital in 1864. And he, he um, described the circumstances that led him to addiction to the US Pension Bureau when he was trying to apply for a pension, which he ultimately never got. Um, fast forward to 1915, so about 50 years after the Civil War, and Perry Bowser died of, quote, chronic morphinism in a soldier's home in Indiana. So that means that this guy, Perry Bowser, ultimately lived two thirds of his life addicted to morphine. That is a long time. Um, for veterans like Bowser and John Gulrick also fell into this category, opiate addiction was really a lifelong disability. It was something that never went away. Um, and for what it's worth, I was surprised when I began doing this research uh, on, on veterans opiate addiction after the Civil War, I was surprised at actually how long addiction could last. I mean, it was a really, long-term health consequence of the Civil War. 
And for me, as a medical historian, I think that's one of the key payoffs of looking into this topic. Um, it shows that the Civil War's health crisis wasn't just contained or uh, compartmentalized into the 1860s. The Civil War started a health crisis that lasted in many cases for a generation, even into the 20th century. It was a long-term health crisis. Um, but anyways, back to John and Fanny. This is how the Civil War's health crisis spawned this epidemic of drug addiction among veterans, and that's the backdrop in which our, our two protagonists, John and Fanny Gulrich, have found themselves in the late 1860s. But what did addiction actually look like in the day-to-day -day lives of veterans and their families? What did addiction mean to people, uh, and what did it cost them in their post-war lives? To answer these questions, we're going to jump forward in time by about 30 years to the year 1896, which was a dramatic year in the lives of John and Fanny. As John and Fanny learned the hard way, the costs of opiate addiction were twofold. On the one hand, opiate addiction was a medical condition that had really dangerous, really serious, life-threatening, really, uh, health consequences. But on the other hand, addiction was also deeply stigmatized. It detracted from one's uh, masculinity, it, it made uh, people like John look like they were bad people, so they lost sort of the reputation in the community. Uh, in other words, addiction was a dual crisis. It was both a health crisis and uh, a social crisis for veterans too. The way, to give you an example, the way that addicted veterans like John actually looked and acted were interpreted by uh, onlookers like Fanny, for example, um, was as being the opposite of how true men should look and act. So take, for example, dependency. Oftentimes we refer to addiction as uh, drug dependency. Well, addicted veterans like John needed to swallow or inject opiates every day, sometimes multiple times a day, just to function, just to get through the, the day, right? So they were quite literally dependent on opiates to survive. But during the Civil War era, standards of behavior for, for white males like John Gorick posited that men should be self-controlled. They were supposed to be independent. They were supposed to be, for example, able to make the decision to simply quit opium and follow through with that and end their addictions. But opiate addiction, or opium slavery, as it was often referred to in the media, um, made living up to these standards that demanded independence and self-control quite impossible. Um, one does not simply quit morphine, right? So addiction was really the opposite of, uh, of independence. Consider also pain relief. For me, this is one of the more interesting facets of opiate addiction and how people actually lived with it. Um, ideas about pain during the Civil War were, were somewhat different than ideas that we hold about pain today. Uh, according to Civil War era medicine, not all people and not all people's bodies were actually supposed to need painkillers to get by. Um, it was thought by most American doctors during this period that only white women were um, supposed to have sensitive enough bodies to actually need painkillers for long periods of time. Like men, according to the medical um, knowledge of the day, were supposed to be stoic. They were supposed to like grit their teeth and sort of tough out the pain without actually needing to take painkillers. So when people like John reached for the morphine bottle um, day after day after day after the Civil War to cope with their, their lingering wartime injuries, it made them look weak, quite simply. It made them look unwilling to bear the pain that they were supposed to be able to handle as true men. So in other words, they seemed unmanly. That's how people perceived them. To make matters worse, people also associated uh, drug addiction with deceitfulness and like unreliability and lies. Right? So addiction made one seem immoral, almost as if you were a bad person because of your addiction. And this, this will probably sound familiar to many of you because this is um, one of the predominant modes of like interpreting addiction today in modern America still. Um, and in fact, people like John did take great lengths to keep their addictions private, to keep their conditions secret from the outside world. And the fact that uh, they hid or disguised their conditions only contributed to this idea that basically um, people who were addicted to morphine were inherently liars. They were inherently immoral and, and bad people. Um, and by the way, because addiction was seen as immoral, Union veterans, um, this is one difference between the experience of Union and Confederate veterans with addiction, Union veterans lost out on things like pensions and, and access to um, uh, the precursor to the VA. And I'm happy to talk more about that in the Q&A. That didn't necessarily apply to John um, because he wasn't eligible for those kinds of programs, but um, it did hurt John's reputation in the community. Opiate abuse also destroyed veterans' bodies and their health. It had very serious um, physical consequences. Um, it would cause impotence, 
It caused fatigue, addiction, also made one susceptible to certain infections that can kill you. Um, I think one of the most compelling examples for me uh, of, of sort of the ripple effects of addiction in, in one's life during this time period was weight loss or emaciation. People who take opioids for long periods of time suffer from really extreme dramatic, like visually dramatic weight loss. And you see this in the medical records of Civil War veterans like John. Some veterans lost you know, 50, 60 pounds. Like they literally appeared skeletal in the eyes of their wives, their families, their doctors. And that's part of why addiction was so scary. It entailed this, this dramatic visual transformation. Um, one addicted veteran put it like this. He described his quote, physical manhood as a wreck, a shell when he was uh, addicted to morphine. And John would have felt that way about himself uh, as well. Now, extreme weight loss was dangerous in its own right. Uh, and it's been linked by, by modern doctors to an elevated risk of infections and, and basically death. Um, but it was more than just a medical effect of addiction. Emaciation also signaled that addicted people, addicted veterans like John, were unmanly. So this is another way that addiction um, changed how people thought about you as a person. This was, after the Civil War, this was a period in American history when a man's body image was uh, uh, inextricably linked to how manly he was. Like men were supposed to be these barrel chested, like strong, almost like Teddy Roosevelt looking dudes, right? So for example, this guy here on the left, uh, I took this image out of literally out of a life insurance manual, the most, uh, according to this life insurance company, the, the, the biggest sort of most stout guys were the manliest and therefore the most insurable. Um, but addiction meant that veterans appeared to be these ghastly thin, literally shells of their former pre-Civil War selves. They were the opposite of manly, like the individual that we see here on the right, who uh, was not a Civil War veteran, but this is one of the only photos uh, of, an, of a person that was addicted to morphine that I found dating from this time period. Now, as you can imagine, when you add all this up, eventually opiate addiction got bad enough that veterans became physically unable to work. And when this happened, it also caused, um, it also started to affect the, the, wives, the, the lives of their wives and their children. Um, for example, when a veteran became unable to work, their, their spouses were forced to, to step in and take over the breadwinning role and earn income for the family. Um, but like dependency and emaciation and the inability to bear pain, this consequence of opiate addiction really represented uh, an inversion of prevailing cultural ideals. Um, Civil War era gender norms, for example, dictated that women were supposed to handle the family affairs and men like John were supposed to go uh, and make the money and to support, to act as the breadwinner. Um, but this was not, and it could not be the case in veterans' families like the Gulrick, like the Gulricks. Um, men like John eventually became physically unable to support themselves. Actually, I found one case, uh, that of a union veteran whose wife, um, who was no longer able to work, whose wife had to resort to prostitution to support herself um, after years and years of, of his opiate addiction. So this could, this could take a really dramatic turn for veterans' families. So when you add all this up, addiction created a tremendously stressful situation for people like the Gulrichs between the fatigue and the impotence and the weight loss and the husband's not working. This was all destined to end in a, a crisis point, a big blow up between veterans and their families. And that is exactly what happened to John and Fanny in 1896. By that point, about 30 years after the Civil War, John was in dire, dire straits. Uh, three decades of morphine addiction had left him thin, emaciated, um, probably impotent. Uh, he was, he, he, in his letters, he describes himself as being unable to focus. He suffered from a debilitating lack of energy and he would sleep for long periods of time. Um, he eventually lost his law practice during the 1890s and thus his ability to bring in money to support Fanny and their children. He was thin, he was in bad health. He was literally on the verge of death and perhaps even worse in elite Southern society, he had lost all claims to manliness and honor, right? Now, considering everything that the morphine had cost John, John naturally swore, he swore up and down to Fanny that he would quit the morphine. Um, at one point he tried quitting cold turkey. He tried simply um, to, to stop taking opium and endure the withdrawal process without any kind of medical assistance. And naturally this approach failed um, just as it did for most Civil War veterans. Most veterans actually tried multiple times to quit uh, using the cold turkey approach and they almost inevitably failed. 
And when they failed, they felt awful about themselves. They grew desperate. Eventually, John grew desperate enough to quit the morphine that he turned to patent medicines, or so-called quack or snake oil medicines. This was actually a, a major business in post-Civil War America. The Civil War spawned an industry devoted to curing opiate addiction for the first time in American uh, history. And I think that really speaks to how big the crisis was after the Civil War. There were so many addicted veterans that there was a, an entire industry of these sort of fake quack cures dedicated to, to supposedly curing them from addiction. Um, after the Civil War, sort of shady, bad faith, so-called doctors invented these miracle cures for opiate addiction. They marketed them to veterans in veterans magazines and newspapers. And we see here some of those advertisements on the slide here. Um, my favorite was actually a brand called Dr. Collins's Painless Opium Antidote. And it was actually invented by a Civil War veteran himself. So he would have seen how his fellow soldiers got addicted to morphine, spotted a business opportunity, and stepped in uh, and made some money. It made him a fortune. Um, John tried one of the more popular brands, uh, a brand of cure, cure in quotations, uh, called the Gold Cure. And that we see advertised here, this third image from the top out of a newspaper clipping. Um, most of these so-called cures uh, and probably the gold cure actually contained opium. So they contained the ingredient that they were promising to cure or to rid the person who consumed the medicine of, right? So this was um, literally, quite literally medical fraud. Um, and so needless to say, just like the cold turkey method, this approach failed John as well. It was a gigantic waste of money, uh, which the Gulricks were already running very low on in 1896 after years of John not being able to work at, at full steam. But again, that illustrates just how desperate John was to quit. He was willing to try anything. So by this point, the Gulrick situation was looking very, very grim. The tension between John and Fanny was mounting and it was increasingly obvious to Fanny as much as she wanted to avoid this, it was increasingly clear to her that John was just not gonna be able to quit morphine probably ever, right? Um, and certainly not uh, under his own self-control. So on one day in February of 1896, this situation exploded. Um, on that day, Fanny returned home to the Gorick's uh, house in Fredericksburg from an afternoon out on the town. When she opened the front door uh, to come inside, she, you know, she swung the door open and she saw John literally slumped over a piece of furniture in what she described as a morphine daze. Now, keep in mind, John had promised to quit, and here he was again under the influence of morphine. She couldn't rouse him. She couldn't get him to stand up. So Fanny, she snapped. After years and years and years of John's broken promises to quit the drug, the family trying to hide this from the public, uh, an inversion of, of the way that the world was supposed to work, according to people like the Gulricks, Fanny simply could not take this anymore. She had had enough, and she wanted a divorce. So Fanny literally ran upstairs, leaving John on the floor of their foyer and penned this dramatic series of emotional letters to her various family members um, in the time that John was under the influence of morphine. Um, for example, in one of her letters, uh, a letter that she wrote to her brother, Fanny wrote to her brother, she described her plan to abandon John and dissolve the marriage. And I think this letter really shows how opiate addiction took its toll on couples like the Gulricks. Uh, as Fanny explained in the letter, quote, there is no dependence to be put in John. What can I do? If only he could break off this horrible habit, but it seems he can't. Soon, um, she added, John, quote, will have gotten over the effects of whatever it is that he took and will then beg and implore me not to do this, not to leave him, but I must, I must, for I can bear neither for myself or my children this life any longer. I am obliged to leave him. I can see nothing else to do. So again, for, for, for someone to um, so openly explain this uh, to one of their relatives, something that they've been trying to keep secret forever, um, really shows how like tense the situation had become. It finally, their, their relationships literally snapped, right? Uh, so Fanny flees the house. She immediately leaves their house in Fredericksburg, goes a few miles up the road to Washington DC and she refuses to ever speak to John again. She wrote uh, a series of scathing, angry, angry letters to all of the Gulrick's relatives, explaining her plan to get a divorce, her rationale for why she wanted to get a divorce. Um, and for their part, naturally, the family lost it. They freaked out. They knew that John, some of them knew that John had had a substance uh, abuse problem, but most of them did not. Uh, and those who, who were privy to the couple's secret didn't realize how bad that it actually was. 
For example, John and Fanny's son, um, John Jr., was a, a cadet at Virginia Military Institute. He um, lost it when he heard the news that his parents were getting a divorce and then why they were getting a divorce. So he wrote his mom a, a series of these desperate letters in return saying that he would like quit school, he would get a job, he would support her, and they would never speak to you know, dad again. Um, so this, this really imploded the family. Meanwhile, Fanny seized control of the family's bank accounts. She got a lawyer and she prepared to file for a divorce. So again, we see this uh, disruption of gender roles. And keep in mind, this was a big step for a society lady in, in 1896 Virginia. This was the social ramifications of getting a divorce and having the secret sort of leaked out into the newspaper gossip columns would have been huge. So this was essentially the nuclear option for Fanny. Um, luckily for his sake, John, uh, John's brother stepped in and talked Fanny down off of the ledge. But what to do, that left the question of what to do with John. Again, there were a couple of different options that you could do um, to, to sort of help Civil War veterans theoretically overcome their opiate addictions, although none of them were effective. So one option that the Gulicks considered was institutionalization. They thought about sending him to the Western State Lunatic Asylum back in Stanton. Um, but they were afraid, as Fanny's sister-in-law explained, that this would get leaked to the papers and that this would cause a hubbub in the press. So they couldn't take that approach. Um, so instead of divorce or institutionalization, the family came up with a third option. They would simply take John, lock him in a room, remove all of the morphine and medical implements from the, the room and force him to detox. He would either emerge dead or cured. That's how um, far, how, how badly this situation had devolved into. Um, and so that's what they did. They sent John to his brother's farmhouse near Fredericksburg. They literally locked him in a room um, for several months, they hired nurses and guards to watch him 24 hours a day while he detoxed cold turkey. And you can imagine the suffering that that would have, would have uh, entailed. So um, the, the sad news, I, you know, I, I want to kind of jump forward a, a few years and sort of give away the, the tragic ending. None of this ultimately helped. Um, eventually, Franny, uh, Fanny and John got back together. She never did divorce him. Um, after about a year uh, of living with his brother, the, the two reunited. <clears throat> but John soon relapsed. He never did, um, he never was able to, to be rid of the, the morphine habit. Letters from 1901 and 1910 and 1917 indicate that John started using the morphine again. Um, and eventually the secret did get out into the press. For example, in 1915, Fanny um, was so ashamed of John's morphine habit that she um, ultimately had to resign her presidency of her local UDC chapter. So it, it harmed her, her social reputation as well. And that kind of illustrates the, the various ripple effects that addiction could have on a family. Even eventually one of John and Fanny's sons, um, John Jr., the cadet at Virginia Military Institute, also became uh, addicted to morphine. So there's some evidence to suggest that um, you know, this was a, an intergenerational problem, that it didn't just stop with John either, it, it persisted on into the 20th century perhaps. Um, and so you know, this was ultimately a, an extremely dramatic, extremely tragic story for the Gulrick family, just like for uh, uh, the broader group of Civil War veterans that struggled with opiate addiction in the wake of uh, the Civil War. So when all is said and done, what do we make of this story? What can the Gulricks teach us about opiate addiction in the Civil War and in American history writ large? I think this saga, the saga of John and Francis Gulrick and their dramatic uh, uh, life uh, and death teaches us a, a few key lessons about the Civil War era opioid crisis in particular. First, I think the fact that John and Fanny had such a polished life, the life that we see here in these portraits, um, but such a tragic private life behind closed doors from my perspective as a historian of Civil War veterans, this really undercuts the, the historian's usual take on veterans. I think oftentimes people like John who survived the Civil War are portrayed as being like well-adjusted, that the war was essentially a blip in time for them, they survived it and then they moved on with their lives and thrived after. But that's not what happened here. Even though John and Fanny gave the appearance or the illusion that they were thriving, in reality, they were struggling. They were barely getting by and eventually their relationship imploded. And I think that's the case for a lot of Civil War veterans who struggled with opiate addiction and other kinds of disabilities. So that is the first lesson. Veterans were not as they seemed. Um, second, I think this story teaches us that the US has a very long history, 150 year history of opioid crises. Uh, again, the first of these crises was triggered by the Civil War itself. 
and 150 years later, we're still in the grip uh, of, of yet another opioid uh, addiction crisis. So perhaps there's something cyclical about opiate addiction in America. And in that case, we really need to think carefully about how to move forward to prevent these kinds of recurring uh, opioid crisis cycles. Um, finally, there, there are some really troubling um, personal legacies of addiction that you can see both in the Gulrick story after the Civil War and in the lives of people who struggle with opioid uh, uh, abuse disorder today. Um, in both cases, then and now, addiction was usually caused by doctor's prescriptions. Um, in both cases, addiction was stigmatized, so much so that it resulted in all kinds of traumatic, profoundly negative outcomes for addicted people. Um, and so ultimately, not that, really not that much has changed, uh, uh, to put it bluntly. And ultimately, the Gulrick's experience with opiate addiction after the Civil War challenges what we think we know about veterans, and it provides new, um, troubling historical context for today's opioid crisis. So thanks for listening in, and I think now we will open up to questions. Yes, thank you very much, Jonathan. That was fascinating. Really, really enjoyed it. And we've got uh, some great questions already uh, coming in from the audience. I want to encourage everyone to keep typing their questions in. As I said at the start, we'll get to as many as we can. And I'll start off with one. Uh, one attendee is asking about the concept of addiction, mm. and speculating that it probably wasn't very widely known in the mid 19th century. So did people talk about addiction or did they use vaguer terms like sickness or immorality to describe this condition? This is, this is interesting for me because when I started doing this research, I also assumed that the, the, the knowledge, both the medical knowledge and sort of the pop culture knowledge about addiction would have been like non-existent in the mid 19th century, right? They didn't have the benefit of modern science. They didn't understand, you know, brain chemistry, things that we know about opioid uh, addiction today. But what I've actually found in the evidence is that the opposite was, was true. Um, 19th century Americans understood, they, they were observant people. They understood a lot more than we give them credit for about uh, addiction. Um, first of all, for example, sometimes they, they actually used that word addiction to describe um, opiate addiction. So you see that word pop up in government reports, um, pension records of addicted Civil War veterans are sometimes literally described as being um, addicts or addicted. Um, there were, you know, there were a variety of, of other terms used to describe addiction, and some of those I use today also. Sometimes it was called in the popular media and newspapers and magazines, it was often called the opium habit or opium eating. But the concept of addiction was clear. Um, doctors knew, if you read through the, the, the medical literature of the day, like medical journals um, and, and case reports, doctors widely understood as early as the 1820s and the 1830s that you could be literally dependent on um, opiates and that you would become so after like two or three weeks of taking the drugs. They knew that it was extremely difficult to quit the drugs. They, they learned, you know, um, even before the Civil War, American doctors realized that the, the cold turkey method, just straight up, you know, not taking any, any morphine and, and trying that strategy to quit, they realized that that wouldn't work. Um, so, you know, like I said, I was, I was very surprised to learn how much of addiction they, they understood. Um, yes, they didn't understand sort of that, that opiate addiction uh, or opioids change the way that the brain works, that it, it sort of rewires your brain, which is something that we understand today. Um, but they understood the other stuff. They knew that you could be addicted. They knew that it was awful. And they knew that um, it was difficult to, to fix, basically. Great. Well, thank you. Yeah, I, I would have assumed the same as uh, the question implied that there wasn't the same kind of understanding. And yeah. it sounds like it was different, but not so different as you might expect. Right, right. Uh, well, Kirsten Bird is asking a question that I'm also intrigued by. Um, how did you come across the Gulricks? Hmm. That's a great question. Um, it was an accident. Uh, <laughs> this is so, so one of the, one of the, you know, um, uh, things that people who, who had, uh, who struggled with opiate addictions in the Civil War era really tried very, very hard to do was to keep it a secret. They didn't want the outside world to know that they were addicted. And so um, for, for a lot of people that meant um, quite literally not writing about addiction in their letters. So it's like extremely difficult to find cases of opiate addiction, both among Civil War veterans and um, non-veterans in the, the late 19th century, because there were, uh, again, all kinds of ramifications. Like if word got out, um, your name might be put in the paper and you might be described as being an opium eater and that carried all kinds of like moral connotations and it made you look um, like a, you know a bad person and less less than you know manly and things like that um, so the Gulricks have the distinction of being one of the only cases that i've ever found in civil war letters 
Civil War letters and diary, it's funny because these are sort of like the major um, traditional sources that scholars have so often turned to when we want to understand something, you know, things about the lives of Civil War soldiers and veterans. But if you use only Civil War letters and diaries to try to investigate this phenomenon of addiction, you're going to basically come up with nothing. And so after a couple of years of, of working on this, this project when I was in grad school, I stumbled across um, literally randomly this letter collection uh, of, a, of a Civil War veteran family called the Gulricks. And it was kind of my last ditch effort to try to discover a, a case of addiction in these sources that I had had no luck with. And lo and behold, they wrote very frankly about addiction in Fanny's letters. And I think that, um, so, so I, I stumbled across these, these letters from 1896 where Fanny is describing, you know, how um, she has come to really resent John and she's going to file for a divorce for that reason and all the different things that, that we talked about tonight. Um, but what really struck me about this case and why I can't get it out of my head is, is how um, she, she wrote about it so openly. And I think for me, the fact that she was so willing to eventually um, go to her family and just basically tell all shows how bad the situation had really become. Um, essentially, her relationship, uh, the relationship between John and Fanny had completely broken down to the point that she had to loop in all these outsiders by writing these open letters. Um, and, you know, letters in the 19th century, it, you know, were not like um, private, you know, text messages, uh, almost like we think of, you know, when we when we text somebody today, hopefully, we, we assume that that text goes to the one person and stays, you know, between two people, right? Um, sometimes that's not the case. But in the 19th century, letters could be circulated widely, they could be um, copied and sent to other family members, they could be literally read out loud in people's living rooms, sometimes the contents could be exposed in the papers. So this was a really risky step for Fanny to take. Um, so to sum it all up, that's how, um, you know, I randomly discovered Fanny's, uh, or Fanny and John's story, but it stuck with me because it's so rare for this kind of thing to be openly discussed in letters in the way that it was with the Gulricks. Yeah, that's great. I'm glad you did discover those. It, it made for a really nice dimension of your talk. I, I liked the way you kind of hung the framework of the story around their experiences that worked really nicely. Um, Ian Stevenson, is uh, wondering what kind of evidence you found, if any, of veterans taking opiates for treating psychological ailments as opposed to the physical ailments that you focused on in your talk? This is a great question. I think one of the um, uh, recent trends for historians has been to look at these like psychological wounds that came out of the Civil War. After the Civil War in the, in the 1860s and 1870s, there was a spike in suicides in the US, for example. So that suggests that veterans suffered from things like depression and post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, I, I've spent a lot of time looking in mental asylum records like the asylum um, in Stanton, Western State, and you see the same kinds of things in those sources. Um, so when you look hard enough, you, you start to realize that some Civil War veterans did self-medicate for what appear to have been uh, things like depression and things like post-traumatic stress disorder. For example, um, uh, there's one, one guy um, that I, I write about in my book um, called, uh, he, he, he just went by George, so I don't know his last name. So to me, he's just George. Um, but this guy, George, um, was described by uh, a group of Civil War surgeons who wrote up his case report for a medical journal um, during the Civil War. They described him as um, self-medicating with morphine every time he would go into a battle. Right before the battle, he would swallow some morphine powders, and they wrote about how it made him feel elated. So to me, that implies that he was scared to go into battle. He was stressed about the prospect of dying. He took some morphine and he turned into almost like a sort of like a super soldier. Um, so yeah, there, there is evidence to suggest that, um, or at least like an emotional super soldier. He was able to cope with um, the experience of battle. So there is evidence to suggest that, that some veterans did become addicted that way. Um, George H was in fact addicted to morphine and that's how his case um, rose to the attention of doctors. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of really interesting and really troubling evidence to, to that effect. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, John Walther is wondering about the supply of opiates. Where was it coming from? Uh, he's, he's asking, were the opium wars of the mid 19th century relevant to your story at all? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, the, the, the events that are going on with the post-Civil War opioid crisis in the late 19th century US from the 60s into the, the 1890s was just one event in a dramatic series of like 19th century events related to opium. Opium was all over the news in all over the global news in the 19th century world, basically. Um, most opium came from, um, at, at this point in time, most opium came from 
um, like Afghanistan and India. So it was grown in some parts of Asia and shipped through these international shipping lines through oftentimes through China. And then it was brought back to American port cities, places like New York and Boston and San Francisco um, through like American merchant vessels. So almost all opium during this time period was imported. Um, you know, consequently, you see if you look in the coroner's records of places like New York City, for example, in the 1840s and 50s, they had a very elevated rate uh, uh, of people who died of opiate overdoses compared to like more rural parts. So it seems that some places had more opium than others. Um, you know, as, as I think most, most people um, who are tuning in might know, the, the U.S. Uh, during the Civil War blockaded the Confederacy, right, the Anaconda Plan, and eventually it did get pretty effective. So if you look at Confederate hospital supply records from like 1864 and 1865, morphine was quite scarce in some parts of the Confederacy. Um, in Virginia, for example, uh, in places that were not Chimborazo, in like field hospitals, or, or there was a, a hospital in Charlottesville, for example, that had these like really acute supply shortages, probably they ran out of morphine. But in the bigger hospitals, places like Chimborazo, um, I, I've, I've learned from looking at their medical records, like those prescriptions that I put up on the screen, uh, that even into the, the part of the war where we think that there were really acute medical supply shortages, there still managed to be enough morphine to give to wounded soldiers. Um, and actually Confederate surgeons prescribed um, opiates at about the same rate as Union surgeons. They both gave out about 50% um, uh, of prescriptions written during the Civil War uh, were for opiates. So it was pretty consistent with the pre-war levels too. Um, but yeah, I'm just obsessed with sort of tracing the global route of, of opium. Um, as, as the, the, the um, question implied, there was also a, a war, a series of wars fought between um, Great Britain and China over the sale of, of opium. So it was, it was also, you know, this is part of, uh, of a bigger global story that deals with themes like colonialism. And it, it's almost as if like the more that you pull on the threads of opiate addiction, the darker that the story gets uh, in a lot of ways. Yeah. Yeah, it's fascinating to think about the connections between these very powerful individual stories and then this global network of trade and supply that they were enmeshed in. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's really one of the more troubling things because um, if, you, if you look at um, the medical records that emerge uh, from um, France in the, the 1870s, France um, fought a war. Uh, I'm, I'm blanking out on the name of the war, but in 1871, France got into a war. And um, I've looked at some French like surgical records dating from that war. Uh, and you see cases of morphine addiction pop up there too. So it seems that there, there, there's something about, um, you know, the use of opioids in, in almost modern war that leads to these crises. Um, food, some food for thought. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Doug Pfeiffer asks about the proportion of soldiers experiencing diseases like dysentery, for example, versus the proportion that suffered battlefield wounds. And then we might also look back to the earlier question about kind of psychological scars and trials as well. Um, were, were diseases like dysentery also a major factor driving people towards widespread addiction? And do you have a sense of kind of the general proportion? I'm sure you don't have numbers for these things. Absolutely, yeah, this is, this is a very unglamorous answer, but um, by far the, the most common circumstance in which both soldiers and veterans and civilians would take opiates was for diarrhea. Um, just straight up, you know, this was one of the really common ailments for, uh, sorry, one of the really common treatments for diarrhea was um, any version of, of opium. Um, laudanum, for example, was something that most women in 19th century America kept in the household and they would give it to their children um, when their children suffered from you know, diarrhea and other complaints. So um, by, by my reckoning, and it's difficult to really count out um, the exact number um, because of how difficult it is to really trace this problem in records, but by, by sort of my guesswork, I, I think that somewhere about 75% of people that I've, whose cases that I've looked at um, began their sort of pathway to opiate addiction through taking opium or morphine or laudanum as uh, a, a medicine for diarrhea. So that's a really unglamorous way uh, to develop uh, an opiate addiction. You're medicating for diarrhea, and then you know, 20 years down the road, you're addicted to morphine. It's it's not a good it's not a good um, you know medical existence uh, in the, the Civil War time, uh, the Civil War era. But um, uh, a lot of people did get addicted through the use of 
of opiates to treat things like, you know, battlefield injuries. Um, for example, I found um, one of the cases that's always really stuck with me um, that I encountered a, a few years ago in um, a, a medical journal called the Boston Medical and Surgical Journal was the case of a, of a Civil War soldier who spent all four years, uh, a Union Army soldier who spent all four years of the Civil War in uh, a Union Army hospital in Philadelphia. Um, early in the war in 1861, he actually got run over by a train. Um, so you can imagine the, the level of pain that this guy would have would have uh, been dealing with, right? So um, uh, in so he was in the hospital for four years. During that time, um, he never you know saw combat. He never um, got to join his regiment, but instead he went through. He endured six different surgeries. The first one was a surgery to amputate um, the leg to deal with you know, the, the, the injury resulting from being run over by a train. And then the five subsequent surgeries were surgeries to fix the botched first surgery. Um, so, you know, it's just like each surgery, this guy gets more and more and more pain. Um, and so uh, by the end of it, by 1865, his surgeon, who was actually a really famous surgeon um, called uh, Silas Weir Mitchell, who's um, this sort of famous late 19th century neurologist, um, he wrote about this guy as being like severely addicted to morphine, so much so that he refused to leave the hospital because he, he was afraid he wouldn't be able to get any more morphine um, to, 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 you know, medicate with. So um, there was, there was uh, a lot of addiction from both circumstances, both from diarrhea and from, you know, things like gunshot wounds and, and other mishaps that it could occur to you in the army. Right. Thank you. Uh, one one attendee um, asked a question about the stigmatization that you talked about. Uh, yeah. That um, you know, opiate addicts uh, experienced. You know, in in the eyes of the community around them, often their family members. Um, have you come across evidence that it was a different kind of story? So sort of within the community of veterans, did they look upon their fellow veterans in you know a more kindly way when they were addicted to to opiates? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. This is something uh, that I spend a, a good deal of my book dealing with. So, um, and, and it's especially apparent in the North. Um, the North had, uh, uh, the U.S., the, U the federal government after the Civil War had a massive pension scheme, right, to, to pay um, recompense to Civil War veterans who were uh, at first, those who were like completely disabled by the war. And then, you know, as you go through the 19th century, the, the pension program gets bigger and bigger and more and more kinds of veterans um, eventually get pensions, even those who are simply just, you know, too old to work anymore or just old, you know. Uh, and so the federal government, you know, paid out millions and millions of dollars of pensions to individual Civil War veterans and their families. Um, the interesting part, and here's my answer to, to the question, um, by the 1890s, like a, a huge constellation of different things could enable you to claim a pension from the federal government. Um, you could, like I said, you could simply be old um, and you could say, you know, I'm too old to care for myself. I wasn't wounded in the war, but that's okay. I'm now old. And since I was in the service, the federal government should, should pay me and my family recompense. But interestingly enough, for the longest time until um, way into the early 20th century, Civil War um, opiate addiction disqualified Civil War veterans from pensions. And I found numerous cases where the Pension Bureau um, went out of its way to deny um, pensions to Civil War veterans who otherwise would have qualified for a pension, like they had lost an arm or a leg and they were completely debilitated. But the Pension Bureau found out through medical exams that these, these individuals were addicted to morphine. And that um, was so stigmatized that it outweighed all of the other stuff. It outweighed um, the, the other factors that made them deserving of, of a pension. So it was a really seriously stigmatized condition. Um, eventually, um, in the mid 1890s, a group of Union Army veterans, not really a group, but sort of just uh, uh, a collection of people who um, resented being like excluded from the pension scheme and from other kinds of uh, charitable things that, that were targeted, uh, that targeted uh, and supported Civil War so veterans in the North. Um, eventually, there was uh, enough of a backlash against the stigmatization that a group of veterans um, demanded that the federal government start providing medical care for um, opiate addicted Civil War veterans. So, you know, in uh, I think 1896, um, the federal government actually opened a clinic in um, what was called a soldier's home. It was a place kind of like the VA. Um, it was like the precursor to the VA. It was a place where Union soldiers or Union veterans could go and live in their old age and receive you know, free food, free medical care, lodging, things like that. Well, in Kansas in the, the late 1890s, the federal government operated a morphine um, addiction treatment clinic that catered to 
Union Army veteran. So even though there was a, a huge amount of, of stigmatization and, and um, real discrimination against people that had, through no fault of their own um, substance abuse problems after the Civil War, there was also this smaller um, but, but concerted movement to push back against that, to get help to Civil War veterans who needed it. Um, and particularly, uh, I think elements of the federal government were active in that too. Very interesting, thank you. Um, so Rob Stevens asks uh, about the fact that by the 1890s and into the 1920s, most opiate users were women. Mm -hmm. uh, he is interested in how you understand this transformation from Civil War veterans to middle and upper class women using opiates. Yeah, this is this is really interesting. And for me, this is one of the, the, the sort of darker parallels between today's opioid crisis and the post-Civil War opioid crisis. Um, uh, for most of the 19th, uh, so, so addiction was actually pretty widespread in, in 19th century America. There were lots and lots of people that were addicted to opiates. And actually, um, scholars who have done some digging into to sort of like quantifying and like looking at the demography of addiction, in the 19th century have, have discovered that probably most people that were addicted to morphine and laudanum and opium were actually women. Um, usually they were white women uh, who were, were uh, as I mentioned in the talk, um, thought to have, you know, according to medical knowledge of the day, they were thought to need painkillers more so than other people because they were seen as um, uh, uh, having like, you know, frailer bodies, right? And so um, white women were overwhelmingly prescribed these medications at higher rates than for example, white men. So most, for, for, for these reasons, we think that probably most people in the 19th century, statistically speaking, who were addicted to opiates were actually white women, which is you know, not Civil War veterans, in other words. Um, but those cases didn't necessarily bother doctors. And this is the really troubling aspect uh, of, of this for me. Um, I found lots and lots of cases of women who were addicted to laudanum and opium in the 1830s and 1840s, and their doctors um, publish case reports in medical journals um, and, you know, they write about it as being like a medical problem, but it's not this huge cultural problem. Like it's not something that warranted uh, opening, you know, drug addiction rehab clinics at the state's, you know, at the taxpayer's expense. It's not something that um, was enough to get reported on in the, the newspapers, right? It was limited to the medical press. But after the Civil War, starting in literally in 1863, 64, you start to see um, a, a media panic, a government panic, a medical panic about all of these guys, these white male Civil War veterans who are all of a sudden addicted en masse to opiates for the first time in US history. So addiction really goes from being something that's really widespread, but almost sort of like a non-issue because doctors aren't really that bothered by it because of the people that are addicted to being like, you know, red alert, you know, alarm bells are glaring here. This is a big cultural and medical crisis because it, it affects, um, you know, the, the white Civil War uh, veterans, right? Who had like a particular social clout during this time period. And like I said, this is a real parallel with today. Uh, there have been, um, for decades in the United States, there have been um, major um, pockets of, of like heroin addiction, for example. But that, you know, even dating back into the 1970s, 1980s, but that has never um, generated uh, the kind of concerted um, effort that we see that has been generated in the last like five years, for example, by um, uh, the prescription opioid epidemic. So if you look at like the demographics of who's addicted to drugs like Oxycontin and Opana, like some of the, the big name brand um, uh, synthetic pharmaceuticals that are like pain pills, um, most people who are prescribed those medicines and then consequently get addicted to them are the same demographic as Civil War veterans. They're white. Um, a lot of them, you know, they tend to be, I think, male. Uh, and so they have, even in today's society, a particular social clout that other more marginalized groups don't get to have, right? And so, yeah. um, so, so I guess what I'm getting at here is that um, even though addiction has always been, uh, opiate addiction has basically always been a problem in American history, it's only when certain kinds of people get addicted that that justifies um, a concerted response to it. And, and that really troubles me. Um, I think, you know, uh, all addicted people deserve a concerted effort to, to have the kinds of medical treatments that they need. So that's one of the takeaways from this. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and part of what you said just now uh, leads us nicely into a question from Ed Durkham. He's asking whether you see similar kinds of problems during and after World War I and World War II uh, with veterans of those conflicts. 
Yeah, Ed, this is my next project. Um, <laughs> I, actually, I did. Yeah, I started. I, I got curious a few years back to see if, if um, you know, World War One medicine also generated this spike in opiate addiction among like doughboys and, and people who returned home um, having suffered from these like really ghastly World War One injuries. And it turns out that it did. Um, if you read um, the New York Times, if you read like. Uh, the Atlantic of the, the late 1910s, the 1920s, you'll, you'll encounter um, pretty easily stories uh, about um, uh, uh, stories that are similar to those that circulated after the Civil War um, about addicted Civil War veterans. Um, this, there's this one um, professor, a, a woman named Jeanette Marks, who was like famous for being um, one of the, the individuals who early in the 20th century first um, advocated for really heavy handed federal controls on drugs. Um, so, so basically the early versions of today's drug laws. Um, and she used addicted World War I soldiers as kind of scapegoats for saying like, this is why we need drug laws because all these doughboys are addicted supposedly to morphine. Um, so again, I think that also speaks to, you know, more troubling parallels about the long history of, of opiate addiction. It seems that every time the US gets into a war, you know, lo and behold, after the war is over, the veterans return home and there's a spike in opiate addiction. You see the same thing after Vietnam, you see the same thing after the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. So something's got to change. Um, we, I don't think we can continue in sort of this, these cyclical cycles of uh, addiction. But yeah, that's my next project. I'm gonna write an article about the post-World War I opium panic. So it's almost like we set you up. The, the last question <laughs> we have time for was pointing towards your next piece of research. Thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, well, I, I just want to say that we're out of time. Unfortunately, there are a number of other questions that we weren't able to get to, and I apologize to those who asked them. Uh, what I will say, though, is that um, I'll send to Jonathan after tonight uh, a list of those questions, which Zoom will send to me. So if you made a comment or asked a question, he'll still get to see it, which is very good, especially because so many of the comments were full of praise for what you've done tonight in sharing your research with us. Um, so I would really like to echo all that praise and congratulate congratulate you on a great research project and a great presentation tonight. Uh, thanks to the audience for being with us and asking questions. And thanks again to you, Dr. Jones. Thank you. Thanks everyone for joining us. And hopefully we'll see you all again at a future event with the Virginia Center for Civil War Studies. Again, November 30th is our next lecture with Dr. Adam Dumby and you can sign up and register for that webinar whenever you like. So thanks again, have a good night and hope to see you next time.